This passage is from Mark, chapter 15, verse 21 to 39. There was a man from Cyrene coming from the fields to the city. The man was Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus. The soldiers forced Simon to carry the cross for Jesus. They led Jesus to the place called Golgotha. Golgotha <laughs> means the place of the skull. At Golgotha, the soldiers tried to give Jesus wine to drink. This wine was mixed with myrrh, but he refused to drink it. The soldiers nailed Jesus to the cross. Then they divided his clothes among themselves. They threw lots to decide which clothes each soldier, soldier would get. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they nailed Jesus to the cross. There was a sign with the charge against Jesus written on it. The sign read, The King of the Jews. They also put two robbers on the crosses beside Jesus, one on the right and the other on the left. And the scripture came true that says they put him with criminals. People walked by and insulted Jesus. They shook their heads, saying, You said you could destroy the temple and build it again in three days. So save yourself. Come down from that cross. The leading priests and the teachers of the law were also there. They made fun of Jesus, just as the other people did. They said among themselves, He saved the other people, but he can't save himself. If he really is the Christ, the King of Israel, then let him come down from the cross now. We will see this, and then we will believe in him. The robbers who were being killed on the crosses beside Jesus also insulted him. At noon, the whole country became dark. This darkness lasted for three hours. At three o'clock, Jesus cried in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabbathani. My God, my God, why have you left me alone? Some of the people standing there heard this. They said, Listen, he is calling Elijah. One man there ran and got a sponge. He filled the sponge with vinegar and tied it to a stick. Then he used a stick to give the sponge to Jesus to drink from it. The man said, We should wait now and see if Elijah will come to take him down from the cross. Then Jesus cried in a loud voice and died. When Jesus died, the curtain in the temple split into two pieces. The tear started at the top and tore all the way to the bottom. The army officer that was standing there before the cross saw what happened when Jesus died. The officer said, This man really was the son of God. Welcome to our Good Friday service. Um, just want to say a big thank you to the Say family who did that uh, Bible reading wonderfully in their front garden uh, this week. So thank you guys for doing that. Um, out of all the days in the Christian year, uh, maybe Good Friday is one of the most significant because it's the day that we commemorate. It's the day that we have the opportunity to really reflect on what it costs Jesus to win our salvation, to win our uh, forgiveness, to win uh, uh, our ability to enter into the grace of God. And so I'm not going to speak for a long time this morning. I know that preachers often say that and then you think, yeah, right. Um, but I'm going to try and keep it uh, quite short this morning and say a few words um, that are things that I feel that God's laid on my heart that are significant um, from the story of the cross, but maybe particularly significant for us today as we face the COVID-19 um, uh, situation as a, as a nation and uh, as the world. Um, actually, while I mention that, if you click at the end of this onto the COVID-19 section of the Restore website, you can download there uh, from there some family resources. And uh, the way that we've done them today is they're uh, resources to be done together as a whole family. So they're not just things to keep the kids quiet. Um, they're ways that we can reflect on the power of the cross together. So at the end of the service, you might want to download those. So um, in this time, I just want to set the scene in terms of the significance of the cross for us and then lead us into an opportunity to take communion where we can uh, encounter the grace of God uh, and, uh, and maybe experience something new of Jesus in these challenging times. Now, um, I think I've said a number of times that for us, for me as an individual, for us as a family, 2019 was a year of quite significant challenge. Obviously, 2020 um, uh, for the nation is a year of massive uh, challenge. But in the middle of 2019, when I was reflecting on it, um, God really spoke to me out of Philippians chapter 3. Now, Philippians chapter 3 is quite a well-known chapter, but it's one of those stories where, G where Paul talks about running the race of faith. And it's quite an inspirational chapter, really. And he talks about letting go of everything else that he might gain the prize of winning Jesus. And uh, we get quite inspired by that whole flow. But right in the middle of it, in verse 8, there's a really interesting verse. And it says this. It says, "...that I may know him and the power of his resurrection." 
and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And sometimes I think we go through the whole flow of the chapter and we almost miss the significance of that verse. Because what Paul actually says in that verse is he says, if I'm going to take hold of the resurrection power of Jesus, then actually I need to become one with his suffering. And he talks about uh, knowing the fellowship of his sufferings. And the word that is used in Philippians chapter 3 is exactly the same word that's used in Acts chapter 2, when the early believers share everything in common. And it literally means to be one. And so Paul talks about the fact that if we can become one with the suffering of Jesus then we'll be able to enter into the resurrection power of Jesus. And maybe one of the reasons we don't dwell on that verse very much is um, it doesn't sound uh, inspiring to become one with the sufferings of Jesus. Actually, that sounds really challenging and really hard. But if you've ever visited or read anything about the persecuted church, you'll know um, that uh, they really esteem their suffering because they've learned that in the midst of suffering, there's an opportunity not only to identify at another level with what Jesus went through when he hung on a cross, but also to take hold of the power of that at another level, at another dimension. And I have a feeling this Easter is going to be different from any other Easter we've ever celebrated before. But I wonder whether in the midst of the suffering that there is at the moment in our nation and in many of our lives, whether Jesus wants to meet with us in a very special way that will actually be a key to us then seeing more of the power of Jesus released in his life, in our lives. And so as I was reflecting on it, there's just three aspects of the work of the cross that I simply want to share a few minutes on each and then we'll come into a time of taking communion together. Um, but the first thing that really struck me, particularly for this year, about Jesus when he was on the cross was the incredible vulnerability that he showed. And I don't know what you think uh, when you think about Jesus. Um, often at Christmas, when I tell the Christmas story, I think about the incredible risk that God took to birth Jesus as a little baby to a couple that weren't married yet, that were probably teenagers, in a uh, not well-loved area of, of Israel. That was an incredible risk that God took. And actually, early on, his life is threatened, and so his parents have to flee to Egypt, to another nation, to keep him safe. Um, and that was a huge risk that God took. But then as Jesus grows up, when we experience the ministry of Jesus, we see the supernatural power of Jesus. And it seems like nothing can withstand Jesus. So Jesus is able to walk on water. Jesus is able to calm a storm. Jesus is able to cast out every demon. Jesus is able to heal any and every uh, disease and even bring people who are dead back to life. And so Jesus, we see, is an all-conquering hero but then in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he makes the choice to go to the cross, from that moment on, we see incredible vulnerability. And we see him being ridiculed. We see him being insulted. We see um, him being stripped naked. And we see a crown of thorns being placed on his head. And every incident seems to expose a greater vulnerability about Jesus. In Matthew 15, in Mark 15, verse 29, it says, after they were twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, hail, king of the Jews. Now, I don't know how you are doing at the moment as we enter into our third week of the lockdown, um, but it strikes me that when a crisis hits, a lot of people go into survival mode to begin with, and we're just dealing with the shock of it and the trauma of it, and we're trying to make a plan just to survive. And then after a couple of weeks, the emotions start to come up to the surface. And one of the things we've been doing as a staff team is we've been having a Zoom call every morning from 10 to 11, and we've just been catching up with one another, and we've been praying together, and uh, praying for us as a church, uh, praying for the nation. Um, but it's been really interesting in the catching up with one another times because we've all been going like that emotionally. And one day we'll be fine and the next day we'll be really vulnerable. What I want to say this morning is Jesus understands vulnerability 
and he knows what it is to feel exposed and vulnerable. And I have a sense that as maybe we've become more um, familiar this Easter with our own frailty and vulnerability, that actually Jesus wants to stand with us and say, I know and I'm with you. I love the way that Eugene Peterson in the message interprets uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 to 16. They're well-known verses, but the message translation, I think, puts it in, in a really significant way for us at the moment. In the message, it reads like this. It says, we don't have a high priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. And today, if you're feeling vulnerable, Jesus wants to stand with you and say, take my help, accept my mercy. As we take the bread and wine together, know that I know what it feels like and I am God with you. So if one thing is the vulnerability of Jesus, the second thing that struck me as I read and reflected on the story of the cross this year um, is just the incredible isolation that happened to Jesus through the whole crucifixion process. Because to begin with, it happened, didn't it, that uh, one of his closest friends, Jesus, betrayed him. And didn't just betray him, but actually betrayed him with a kiss. And so an act that should have been an act of love was an act of rejection and an act of pain. And what I know for many people in this current season is they feel very alone. And sometimes when we're alone, we can feel let down by other people. We can feel like, where are my friends? Where are the people who said they loved me? And Jesus, right the way through the crucifixion experience, had exactly those things happening to him. Because he had it first with Judas, but then he had it with the rest of his disciples. He had it with Peter. There's uh, the really moving account in the Garden of Gethsemane where Peter, James, and John go with Jesus into one of his most uh, uh, difficult moments on earth, deciding whether to go to the cross or not. And three times Jesus says, stay with me, watch with me, pray with me. And then Jesus prays and agonizes, pours out his heart. And every time he, when he looks back and goes back to his friends, they're asleep and they've let him down. And then when he's arrested and, Jesus, and uh, Peter, the one who said, I'll never, I'll never betray you, I'll never leave you. Peter's the one who before the cock crows three times has deny Jesus, and Jesus is left all on his own. And then at the height of the agony of the crucifixion, we get darkness covering the whole land, and so darkness swallowing up Jesus as he's absorbing the, all of the sin of human history, all of my sin, all of your sin. And then as we read the account of that in Mark 15, it says, now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land, until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And one of the greatest pains of Jesus on the cross was as he took on our sin, knowing that it's sin that separates us from God, he felt total desolation, isolation, and separateness from God. If you've been feeling really isolated and alone, Jesus knows and Jesus wants to stand alongside you and say you're not on your own. In John's Gospel, Jesus promises us, he says, I will not leave you as an orphan, but I will send my spirit to be a comforter, to be a helper to come alongside. And this morning, as we take communion, I believe for some of us who felt really isolated and on our own, Jesus is physically going to come and meet with us by his spirit and say, I know what it means to feel like that. And the last thing that I just want to draw out for a couple of minutes from the uh, story of the cross is actually the cross culminates in Jesus dying. In verse... Uh, uh, 
20, uh, 46, in uh, Luke 23, verse 46, it says, Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. What's happening at the moment in this nation is unprecedented. Last night, nearly 8,000 people so far have died from the COVID virus. And we know there's going to be potentially many more deaths. We're obviously praying um, that God will turn around the situation, but the likelihood is there'll be many, many more deaths. Nearly everyone that I know either knows someone who's currently sick with COVID or someone who's died because of it. In our nation, there's a huge amount of grief. Some of that grief is because of the loss of loved ones. Some of that grief is the impact of the COVID virus. For, for many people, they've lost jobs. Maybe you've lost jobs. Uh, for many people, we've had to put dreams on hold. Uh, for many of us, there's just been the loss of the ability to go and do what we want to do. And there's levels of grief after grief after grief. I just want to say to you this morning, Jesus knows what death feels like. And in situations of grief and loss, Jesus is wanting to stand alongside us and bring comfort and lead us through. We're very familiar with Psalm 23 that uh, talks about, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And in these challenging times, Jesus is wanting to bring his comfort and stand alongside us. And not only that, but Jesus is wanting us to be, if ever, this nation needs a group of people who are not thrown by death and are able to bring comfort to others, it's now. I just want to bring up on the screen a, a, a book that's uh, probably not a well-read book, um, but it's a book written by a doctor who lived in the UK at the time of the first Methodist revival. Now, the Methodist revival took place in uh, the extremities of the UK, in, in Wales, in uh, Cornwall, in the mining communities, and they often had plagues and diseases that wiped out loads of people. And uh, a, a doctor, Joseph McPherson, wrote a book called Our People Die Well. And the subtitle is Glorious Accounts of Early Methodists at Death's Door. And the book contains 96 accounts of early believers who died in an extraordinary way that spoke something of the grace of God to the people around them. A quote from the book, most people die for fear of dying, but I've never met with people such as yours. They are none of them afraid of death, but are calm and patient and resigned to the last. Why? Because it's the difference that Jesus makes. And I, every day, I pray protection of the blood of Jesus over my family. I pray protection of the blood of Jesus over the whole Restore family. I pray a covering of the blood of Jesus over our nation. I pray that actually not one person in the Restore family will be lost through this COVID crisis, but I can't control the outcome. What I do know, know, though, is that Jesus has defeated the power of death. And even if we end up uh, going uh, to, uh, to uh, reaching the point where we breathe our last breath, we're going to step into a new realm where we meet with the face of Jesus. And in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we sang some of the words from it earlier in one of the songs that Michelle led us in. Paul writes, death swallowed by triumphant life. Who got the last word, O death? O death, who's afraid of you now? It was sin that made death so frightening and law code guilt that gave sin its leverage, its destructive power. But now in a single victorious stroke of life, all three, sin, guilt, death are gone. The gift of our master, Jesus Christ, thank God. 
And part of what we celebrate over Easter weekend is that death will not reign in this nation. Death will not reign in our life. But Jesus is bigger than even the power of death. And we're going to pray and we're going to prophesy and we're going to release the power of the life of Jesus over this nation and over us as a community. Because death is not the end and we can face death and walk through it into resurrection life and resurrection power. And it's what Jesus promises us and invites us to take hold of this Easter as we celebrate the work of the cross. just want to remind you of that verse uh, from Hebrews chapter 4 and read it again before we enter into a time of taking community. We don't have a high priest who's out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing. He's experienced it all, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. And this morning, as we take communion, we're going to walk right up to Jesus And we're going to take his mercy and we're going to accept and be able to receive his 